Hello, and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Liz Kay, and I'm joined by producer Chris Judge of the Class of 2005. Here on the Providence College Podcast, we bring you interesting stories from the Fryer family. This week, we're talking with Dr. Abigail Brooks, Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of the Women's and Gender Studies Program at PC, as well as Kara Berlin Gallo, a senior majoring in Women's and Gender Studies, as well as History. We're talking to Dr. Brooks and Kara on International Women's Day about the evolution of the Women's and Gender Studies program at PC and the role of the program. Dr. Brooks and Kara, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here today. I'm so appreciative. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Brooks, could you start us off by telling us about Women's and Gender Studies as an academic discipline? What does it draw upon? What are its sources and methods? Well, women's and gender studies is an interdisciplinary discipline. So, you know, again, just very important to emphasize um, that um, within women's and gender studies, um, as a course of study, you're going to be incorporating multiple disciplines across the social sciences, the natural sciences, and the humanities. Um, But when Women's Studies was first started or founded um, as a program um, in the United States in 1970 um, at San Diego State and then at Cornell um, shortly after that in 1970, um, you know, the rationale behind the need for Women's Studies at that time was was Women's Studies um, as a discipline um, largely stemmed from the fact that women's knowledges, women's perspectives, women's experiences, uh, women's grievances, women's contributions um, were largely left out of what was being studied at that time um, in undergraduate institutions. Um, So, you know, when students were taking courses in history or in English or in the natural sciences, um, you know, or um, in the arts, um, largely uh, the experts, the contributors, um, the scholars, the researchers that were being studied were male um, and largely white and male. So um, women's and gender studies came about as a discipline Um, through a combination of activism um, among students, among faculty, um, and among, um, you know, individuals and members who are organizing outside of the academy um, as well. And, um, you know, again, the the impetus was um, really wanting to begin to center women's contributions across the disciplines, um, you know, beginning to unearth women's contributions across history um, in these different disciplines, um, beginning to center, um, you know, women's current live realities and contributions across the disciplines, um, and certainly also centering um, gender inequalities, um, you know, oppression around gender, right, um, was, was very much a part of what, um, what was called on to be centered Um, in the discipline of women's and gender studies. Um, So all of that was was critically important. And, you know, a lot of what you heard from those very first um, founders of women's studies as a discipline was they were reading texts in college um, that weren't reflecting their own lived experiences. So not only were they not reading text by women, um, but they were reading about, um, you know, experiences, frameworks of knowledge, um, research research on particular subjects, none of which was incorporative of women. So um, there was a real feeling of a disconnect when um, students were reading a philosophy text or a history text um, from the perspective of not seeing themselves or their own lived experiences or their histories reflected in those texts. And also, again, as I've said already, not reading texts authored by women. Um, and then there are other really key tenets to the to the discipline of women's studies, now women's and gender studies um, in many uh, collegiate and graduate school settings. Um, there, there are um, variations on that title of, as well, women, gender and sexuality studies, um, feminist studies, uh, gender and intersectionality studies. So there are a lot of variants um, on that original coinage um, of naming the discipline simply women's studies. But one other one Another key tenant um, in the early founding of the discipline um, was um, really um, pedagogical 
Um, from the perspective of a non-hierarchical pedagogy, um, this, um, this notion of um, collaborative learning, um, learning from each other, um, you know, le uh, equal learning spaces, um, all of that was very important. Also, the merging of theory and practice, so this idea that um, knowledge and knowledge building um, should be happening simultaneously inside and outside the academy, um, you know, scholars, um, you know, were also practicing activism and vice versa. So kind of breaking down of the walls between the academy um, and activism and social movements. Um, but again, all of that um, kind of in the vein of uh, wanting to push back against traditional models um, of higher education at that time, right? In the sense of being hierarchical, in the sense of being male-centered, um, and in the sense of kind of being isolated um, from live reality, social justice, social justice movements at that time. So it sounded like women's studies as a, a discipline developed in the 1970s, but um, PC's program is only celebrating its 25th anniversary in, in, in 2019. And that was the year that the program's name was changed to reflect gender studies, as you as you mentioned. Can you tell us about how the program was founded and um, about that decision to change the name? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Women's Studies was founded at Providence College in 1994, um, you know, due to the incredible <laughs> um, galvanizing of, of work and energy and brain power and activism on behalf of a wonderful group. Um, of women faculty across several disciplines, across English and psychology, sociology, now sociology and anthropology, um, you know, art, art history, theater, dance and film um, and others. And certainly that that original original founding of the program was uh, authored and spearheaded by the phenomenal um, Dr. Jane Lunan Perel, um, Professor Amaretta um, of English and Women's and Gender Studies, but she was joined by a wonderful group um, of faculty, Dr. Marianne Sedney, who is a retired um, faculty member um, in WGS and psychology, Dr. Charlotte O'Kelly, who's phenomenal, who's still here with us um, in sociology and anthropology and women's and gender studies, Dr. Wendy Oliver, W. Jess in theater, dance, and film, and certainly Dr. Deborah Johnson, um, who is emeritus in women's and gender studies and art and art history, and who's continuing to teach our phenomenal course with Dr. Oliver, a Women in the Arts, 1960 to Present. So yes, the program was founded um, in 1994 as a minor program, as a women's studies minor. Um, and then um, in 2004, um, the women's studies program added the major, right, which was, again, um, written up um, by many of these same phenomenal faculty, inclusive of Dr. O'Kelly um, and others, um, Dr. Uh, Jane Lunan Perel and others. Um, and um, so again, so the minor uh, was initiated in um, 1994, the major was initiated in 2004. Um, and, um, you know, the program um, has been vibrant and growing since that time. Um, I'm really proud of the fact and our faculty and students and staff are really proud of the fact that we have a thriving major in women's and gender studies. Um, you know, not all programs nationally have a major at this time. So again, you know, there are many that do, but there are still many that, uh, that don't yet. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, but yes, then in actually the spring of 2019, um, we officially changed our title to Women's and Gender Studies, um, which was um, a very exciting um, and inclusive move for us um, in light of, of changing our title to Women's and Gender Studies. We had a phenomenal um, workshop led that spring in June. Um, with our core WGS faculty um, and an outside facilitator, facilitator um, Dr. Carlin Crowley, um, who at that point was the head of the Cassandra um, Voss Gender Center at St. Norbert's College. Um, and we had a real uh, week-long teach-in on revisioning, redesigning our curriculum, um, developing um, new course trajectories, um, incorporative of our title change. Um, and that work, of course, that was the culmination of a lot of work that had been ongoing since our external review in the fall of 2000 
2017, um, collaborative work with students and faculty, right, around um, this title change and its implications um, for curriculum and more. Um, but yes, including um, gender in our title, I think is really important on a few different fronts. Um, it signals inclusivity, right? So, you know, women's, women's and gender studies means that you know, everybody should be potentially interested in taking a WGS course. <laughs> Women's and gender studies is 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 open to everybody across all genders. Um, you know, inclusive of those who identify as male, right? So when you take a women's and gender studies course, um, you are placing women's lives, ex lives, experiences, knowledges, struggles um, at the center of analysis in terms of where you begin to ask questions, what the starting point is, where and you build analysis out from. Um, but we're also centering gender, gender as critical categories of question asking, of analysis, of research, right? Um, so again, it's it's opening up our intro courses, our intro to WGS courses and our electives more explicitly to the study, not only of women, um, but if gender itself is a critical category of questioning, of analysis. Um, and it's very much signaling that these are courses, that our WGS courses are courses um, that are applicable um, and interesting and important for everybody um, across genders across identities, um, again, and not just um, courses that are of interest or of import to women only and those that identify as women only. So all of that is really, really important. And um, I'm really excited about how we've revisioned um, our curriculum and our intro to women's and gender studies courses. We offer three sections of intro to women's and gender studies each semester. Also in some of our new really exciting electives, um, increasingly which center gender, right? Um, apart from only women, uh, we have a combination of courses um, which do both of those things. And we have new electives that we've developed um, around the LGBTQ plus experience um, in particular. So we're really excited about um, how we're continuing to expand our curriculum, um, you know, again, signal inclusiveness and openness in terms of, um, you know, reaching students um, across the spectrum and um, students um, who might have otherwise not understood that uh, a woman's studies course might be something that they um, would be interested in um, or would be excited about um, being exposed to. Can you tell us a little bit about how some of those intro courses have changed and about some of those new electives? Yes, absolutely. So. Um, again, you know, for, for the intro courses, um, we spend um, a lot of probably the first two to four weeks or so, um, sometimes a little longer, depending on, on um, you know, on which course and, and which faculty member is um, shepherding you through um, our intro uh, to women's and gender studies course. Um, but we spend, you know, the first, the first, um, segment of the course, um, doing a really rigorous history um, of uh, women's and gender studies, women's and gender studies movements, um, mostly in the United States in context. Um, and we start out um, our history and our study of women's movements and of feminisms, um, again, through an explicitly intersectional lens. Um, so what that means is, um, you know, starting way back when, if we're thinking about the United States in particular, and I can talk a little bit more about how we do transnational work and global work um, in our intro courses, as well as within some of our electives. Um, but in terms of centering the United States and the United States in history, um, what we do in our intro courses um, is that we, you know, ask these questions about, um, you know, what it meant to do your gender, uh, what it meant to be female, um, you know, how and in what ways gender was organizing societies and, you know, rights and lack of rights um, and power and status. And we start those asking those questions, like I said, um, looking back into the history of the United States, uh, most specifically in those first few weeks. Um, and what we do um, is we look at Native American cultures, um, and rich societies and, um, and, and societal traditions and systems of governance 
Um, we look at what, what was happening in terms of gender and doing gender and gender exploitations and oppressions within the horrific institution of chattel slavery in the United States. Um, we look at how gender was being conceptualized and experienced and how gender inequality was operating in the context of white Anglo America. Um, as it emerged, right, um, at the point of first contact in the late 1500s and 1600s and throughout um, the early to mid 1800s, and we're always shifting the lenses. So um, we're always shifting the lens in terms of, um, you know, who and, and, and whose experiences, whose struggles, whose knowledges we're centering. Um, so again, we're doing explicitly intersectional work in terms of looking at a diversity um, of native traditions and cultures and systems of governance, um, of Anglo traditions and systems of governance, um, of what was occurring um, within um, the horrendous, um, you know, uh, horrendous uh, history and um, systematic oppressions um, of Black Americans at that very same time. And then we move forward um, and we start to look at the different movements, right, and the organization around pushing uh, for equality, uh, for gender justice, um, for, uh, you know, a gender justice and racial justice um, and justice for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you know, all of those movements we look at in concert, um, you know, from, you know, maybe around, I don't know, late 1500s, 1600s up, right, into the current day. Um, so, and again, what we do is we I know I'm, I'm talking a lot here. There's a lot to, <laughs> to cover, um, but what we do is we we start, you know, uh, way, way, way back, you know, 1500s, 1600s. Then we move up to the what's called the first wave of the women's movement, um, sort of in terms of um, you know how it's coined, which is in the 1850s um, through you know women's right to vote in 1920. Um, and then we look at the second wave, which is in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Um, and then we really look at, you know, the, the third wave, right, which is the, I don't know, mid to late 80s, 90s, and, and into the 2000s. So um, in doing all of that, um, and in um, studying that history, um, and into the present day, um, you know, we're centering gender and constructions of gender, gender inequalities, gender injustices in dialogue with and always in relation to uh, gender identity, sexuality, race, class, age, ableism, right? And we're always shifting those lenses. So, you know, absolutely 100 percent. Um, with the inclusion of gender um, in the title of women's and gender studies. Um, part of what we're doing, as I said, is making explicit studying gender as a critical category of analysis and all, all the work that we're doing in intro, uh, but it also, that shifting of our opening up of our title to gender also coincided um, with a lot of work that we've done to become more explicitly intersectional um, across multiple critical, critical categories of analysis that are always in relation to that category woman or that category gender. So that would also be race, that would also be class nationality, age, ableism. Um, and that's really doing, um, you know, in some ways, my, what you might describe as intersectional feminisms, right? Or intersectional feminist work. That seems like an awful lot to do in one semester, but yeah. uh, I'm sure that the students are really energized. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It is. And again, you know, I think that, you know, there are, every, every intro course is, is a little bit different. Um, we have great collaboration and conversation and dialogue among and between all of us who teach Intro to WGS. Um, so we're a wonderful um, community of faculty. Um, but but we you know but but absolutely um, those are the goals that we share and you know we we go about achieving them in slightly different ways um, across the different courses. But we definitely spend a lot of time, like I said, on history history of the movements. Um, history of struggle, hi history of inequalities, um, you know, across these intersectional um, sort of um, lenses, across these intersectional um, lived experiences. We're heading towards the third decade of women's and gender studies at, at PC. Can you tell me a little how the program has grown over the years? Um, how many students are choosing to major and minor and, and take some of the courses that are being offered? Absolutely. I'm so proud of how we've grown over the years. Um, we now have 
we're coming up on 60 students strong. So we have 57 students. We have 21 uh, majors, uh, 36 minors. Um, we have, um, I'm really proud of the diversification um, of our students here at Providence College. Um, about 30% of our students identify um, as students of color. Um, we have two um, male identified students among our majors and minors today. Um, we still um, have not had a graduate graduated uh, male uh, WGS major since um, the phenomenal Nicholas Saylor, class of 2017, I believe, who's now currently working at Providence College. Uh, but we're really working on diversifying um, in terms of gender. Uh, but we're really proud of our diversification, of our growing numbers. We're coming up on, you know, on 60 students strong, which is really exciting. Um, definitely by far and away, the, the largest numbers we've had in the history um, of the founding of the program. So that's really exciting. Um, in terms of other program growth, um, we're just really proud and excited of the richness of our courses that we offer each semester. Each semester we offer between 10 and 14 really exciting cross-listed electives, um, again, across the natural um, and social sciences and the humanities. So, you know, whether it's, um, you know, I mean, I would love to give a list of some of our course titles because they're so exciting and phenomenal. Um, maybe I will in a minute. But what I also was going to share was just that we have, you know, uh, coming up on 20 faculty um, who teach across, you know, 16 plus departments and programs for us. Um, and so we have a wonderful, rich um, and very enthusiastic array of faculty, again, across the natural and social sciences and the humanities and the arts um, who are all teaching um, in WGS who are women's and gender studies affiliated faculty and who teach really, really, really wonderful courses for us. And one other thing that I would love to share um, before maybe I just throw out a couple of our <laughs> new and ex most exciting maybe course titles, although they're all wonderful, um, equally wonderful, um, is that um, we have just such an exciting array of students um, today in women's and gender studies in terms of um, how they uh, embody interdisciplinarity. So, you know, in terms of um, our, what our students are, are um, centering in their own courses of study, um, our students themselves reflect, um, you know, over uh, 20 different um, disciplines, right, in terms of what they're doing. A lot of students are double majoring in biology and women's and gender studies, finance and women's and gender studies, marketing and women's and gender studies, economics and women's and gender studies, sociology, anthropology, psychology, political science, art, art history, theater, dance, and film. Um, you know, uh, Black studies is a really popular and really, really important um, complement and combination um, with women's and gender studies. Um, we just have so many students um, who are either double majors, um, or women's and gender studies majors um, with minors that reflect just such an exciting um, richness um, of fields and disciplines. So I'm really excited about how um, women's and gender studies increasingly our students in the last couple of years are reflecting just more and more of a diversity of disciplines. And in those ways, again, centering gender is a critical category of analysis. Um, centering intersectionality, right, across um, a more, um, I'm sorry, a richer and more expanding um, range of disciplines. Political science is another one, uh, really exciting political science, women's and gender studies, double majors, history, English. Um, so yeah, just I'm really excited and proud um, of our students in terms of um, how they're diversifying, um, you know, across all of these different measures when it comes to discipline, um, when it comes to lived identities, um, when it comes to um, the kind of work that they're doing inside, but also outside the classroom. Um, another, another aspect of the program that we're really proud of um, is um, our growing, um, both long, long standing, but solidifying and growing partnerships um, with local organizations, um, local, local gender justice um, and women's just, uh, sorry, gender justice and women's organizations um, in, in the greater Providence area. So whether it's Day One or Sojourner House or Gloria Gemma um, Breast Cancer Foundation and others, um, increasingly we have students doing really wonderful work um, in the field 
at these different organizations. Um, also, another in, um, increasingly uh, popular site for our women's and gender studies students is uh, local politics at the Rhode Island State House. Um, you know, so in terms of um, growing our program. Um, Courses are expanding, growing, um, but also um, placements for students outside the classroom um, are expanding and growing. And then um, I would also say, um, I am just so enthusiastic about our program. It's hard for me um, to be um, not wanting to talk all day about this. But um, what I was also just going to um, quickly add is that Women's and Gender Studies um, really, really works hard to partner with student organizations on campus. So, you know, we're really proud of what we're doing in the classroom, you know, outside of the Providence College campus and the greater Providence community, um, but also on campus, um, you know, in terms of um, student activism, student organization, wonderful student programming um, outside the classroom on campus. So we partnered with Shepard a couple of weeks ago, and they did a phenomenal training on gender fluidities and gender identities. We um, we did wonderful um, co-sponsoring work last week in honor of International Women's Day lead up and the first you know, week of Women's History Month um, with the Providence College Democrats, collaborative, wonderful panels they organized around being a woman, doing gender at PC among student and student groups, and then among faculty. Um, and we, we really uh, pride ourselves on co-sponsoring and supporting work organized by Women Empowered, Women Will, the MSA, um, you know, student organizations and groups on campus. Um, and that's something that we really enjoy doing in terms of that um, kind of mission of women's and gender studies as being non-hierarchical, collaborative. Um, you know, again, um, we learn as much from our students as they're learning from any of, that, any of us. And in many respects, students are leading the way, uh, which is how it should be. So we, we really, really enjoy our partnerships and collaboration and support. Um, of um, students and the work, um, particularly that's being um, spearheaded among students and student leadership positions and student groups today on campus when it comes to gender justice, gender equality, um, and um, all of that. So that's something we really pride ourselves on as well. So Dr. Brooks, there's so many questions I wanna ask, but I don't wanna neglect or leave behind. Um, so where do women's and gender studies students go on too because they're coming from all of these interesting places and, and doing often intersex, um, interdisciplinary work between different disciplines. You mentioned the natural sciences, humanities, social sciences. Where do they then take these skills and, and go go on? To, what do they go on to do? So glad you asked this question. And one of the um, increasingly popular double majors um, for women's and gender studies students is health policy management as well. Um, I was going to run down the list of everything and I didn't do that. I just kind of spoke, um, you know, off the top of my head and, and some, some great fields were left out. And um, when I was cataloging everything that our WGS students are doing, but yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of post-college um, career trajectories, jobs, um, grad school, then career trajectories and jobs. Um, what we what we see in the last um, you know five to you know seven eight years or so is increasingly our students are going into health, um, centering women in health, whether they're bio double majors with WGS or HBM double majors with WGS. So going into maternal health, um, infant health, um, wanting to go into um, um, other fields of health, healthcare, and medicine, um, but bringing a gender lens into that work. Um, so certainly health and medicine is very popular among our alumni, health policy, um, public policy fields, um, bringing a gendered and gender justice lens into those fields, um, going on in research um, in the natural sciences, um, going on um, to become researchers, um, particularly in the fields of biology, eco bio. Um, we have um, majors who are either currently in law school um, who have grad or who have graduated from law school who are doing work, particularly um, in arenas of law centering immigration rights, um, centering women's rights um, in the law. Um, so yes, law, health and health, health and medicine, um, public policy, higher education is very popular among our graduate students. Um, wanting to um, do work in the collegiate 
um, arena, um, particularly centering support um, for gender equity and gender justice across um, the different um, sort of um, spaces in um, collegiate settings, a uh, setting. So that's also very popular among our, our graduates. Um, yes, but I think that the, the broad range of, of what our students are doing um, in a really rich array of fields um, post-college, um, again, speaks to um, the, the power, the importance, um, and the strength of interdisciplinarity, and um, the fact that our students are women's and gender studies majors and minors, but in and through achieving that major and minor, they've learned how to become good writers. They've learned how to become good researchers. They've learned how to be good, how to become <clears throat> really well-developed, critical, reflexive thinkers. Um, and you know, uh, all of that you know feeds into um, sort of opening up a range of opportunities for them um, post college. I mean, we also have students who go into academia. Um, we have um, graduates who have gone on to get PhDs um, either in women's and gender studies or in um, other fields often that they double majored with, but bringing again that critical gendered lens into that work or into that field. So sociology, anthropology would be one example of that. Um, yeah, and I'm just um, there, you know, I'm, 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 leaving, I'm leaving fields and, um, and students out um, journalism, journalism is another um, arena I'm thinking of with a couple of graduates of Providence College. We have, uh, who are women's and gender studies majors or minors. Um, we have uh, social work um, and different arenas of social work, particularly working with women, uh, women and children um, in the context of homelessness, in the context of other lived struggles. So again, centering gender in the work um, certainly counseling psychology, therapy, psychology, thinking of some other students um, in the recent past and what they're up to. I would also add that we have an incredibly dedicated, passionate um, alumni base among our WGS graduates. So <clears throat> we have 250 plus students that we communicate with. We've created um, an alumni listserv. We update it every year um, with our graduating seniors. And that's just something that we really value, you know, staying in regular contact with our alumni. They're very passionate about their, their the, the WGS faculty they had here. They're community in WGS, um, other students and alumni that they stay in touch with. And it's been um, really wonderful because I actually have been reaching out to our women's and gender studies alumni over the last few weeks um, about the upcoming 50th anniversary um, of the first year of women who started at Providence College in 1971, and also um, about um, the phenomenal Dr. Charlotte O'Kelly, who's in women's and gender studies and sociology and anthropology, and who will be retiring at the end of this academic year. And we're organizing <clears throat> a really wonderful tribute to her on behalf of WGS current students and alumni, um, wherein students are writing tribute letters to her and we'll be sharing words um, about her um, and in tribute to her um, at the event that we're organizing um, later on um, next month in April. So um, it's, it's really wonderful to have such a passionate, dedicated um, group of WGS alumni that we stay in touch with and that we continue to communicate with. And certainly, as you mentioned um, at the top of um, this interview, um, Today, we also really had the opportunity to connect and catch up um, with our alumni at the 25th anniversary celebration of the, of the Women's and Gender Studies program um, in the fall of 2019. And we had wonderful panels there on feminisms after graduation, on doing intersectionality, on the founding of the program. Some of the founding mothers were centered. Um, at that event, as well as um, the Me Too movement, student activism on and off campus, there was a panel with alumni and current students. So um, that was a really wonderful coming together, but saying all of that just along the lines of um, having a vibrant alumni community um, is something that we really enjoy um, as part of the work we do here in women's and gender studies. 
So Dr. Brooks, let's let's make some of those alumni jealous. And if you could tell us a little bit about some of the courses that they unfortunately <laughs> missed out on because they graduated too soon. Um, yes. If you could tell us about a few. Yes, absolutely. Well, we we have so many, like I said, so many phenomenal courses. Oftentimes, um, you know, one of the complaints I hear from our WGS seniors is, oh my goodness, I'm so frustrated. I couldn't take, you know, this course or that course before I graduated. Oh, you know, like I wish I wish I could stay for another semester and take some more courses, um, which is a wonderful complaint to, to leave with, um, to leave hungry for more courses. I, I love I love hearing that. Um, and one thing, um, I don't know if we have time for this too, but I, I would love to just give a quick brief overview of what, what goes into the minor and the major, you know, just to, to let people know about what that looks like. I'll just say real quick before I offer up a few courses um, that we're really excited about um, that we're offering um, and that we've um, just recently adopted and will be offering um, in the near future. Um, the, the Women's and Gender Studies minor is Intro to Women's and Gender Studies and then the Women's and Gender Studies capstone your senior year and then four women's and gender studies electives and two of them have to draw from the humanities disciplines so whether that's theater dance and film English history um, art art history um, you know all of the realm of the humanities and then two of those have to draw from the social and natural sciences so whether that's sociology and anthropology political science American studies black studies biology, psychology. And then for the major, it's just intro to WGS, capstone, and then eight women's and gender studies electives. And out of those eight, six has, uh, six, I'm sorry, three draw from humanities, three social natural sciences, and two have to be, you know, um, at a certain level, we have a kind of a gradated level of our courses. Um, but just to point out that um, the major, um, again, is, is largely centered in um, electives um, across the disciplines. Um, so yes, in terms of our, our courses um, that we offer each semester, again, between 10, 14, sometimes even 15 electives each semester for our students, some of our, our recent course offerings that we're very excited about um, that are being offered um, for the first time this semester, spring 2021, are Black Feminisms with Dr. Ashley Smith Purveyance, who's phenomenal, incredible new um, assistant professor here at Providence. College and Black Studies and Public Community Service. We have Race, Class, Gender, Intersections and Inequalities with Dr. Christopher Chambers, who's WGS affiliated in Sociology and Anthropology um, and WGS. We have Women in Christianity, which is the first course that we, we've offered as a theology cross list with Dr. Despina Process, the brilliant Dr. Despina Process. Um, and that's very exciting because our students can take a theology course that meets one of the theology core requirements that's also a women's and gender studies course. So um, in terms of philosophy courses, we have topics in feminist ethics, women philosophers. So again, students can take their philosophy courses with a women's and gender studied lens or, or focus. Um, other courses um, that students love and that we're re really excited about offering um, currently and in recent years, um, the LGBTQ plus experience beyond the, beyond the closet, which is offered by Dr. Maureen Outlaw, who is WGS and um, sociology in anthropology. Um, really, really popular courses include consumer society, um, globalization and social justice, um, the global food system, power of whiteness. Those are all a shout out to the amazing Dr. Charlotte O'Kelly. Um, gender health and technology, gender medicine and care are two really wonderful upper level cross-listed electives with health policy management. Um, and women's and gender studies, um, fairy tales, folk tales, and feminisms, telling stories of gender, race, and class um, is a wonderful uh, WGS elective um, taught by um, our wonderful um, adjunct, um, Dr. Gloria Jean Mascherati. Um, I could go on and on and on. We have uh, gender, dance, and sport, uh, women in the arts, 1960 to present, um, 19th century British novel, Toni Morrison, 
Victorian age, those are all English cross lists. Um, with history, um, given that it is a Women's History Month too, we have um, the phenomenal Dr. Jennifer Aluzzi who teaches our Global Feminisms class, uh, the phenomenal Dr. Margaret Manchester who teaches our American uh, Feminisms courses, the History of the Women's Movement courses, um, two different courses actually looking at the American women's movements in different eras. Um, and we also have Dr. Claire Rusin who's a brand new faculty member here here in history um, at Providence College, who's teaching our intro to WGS, one of our intro to WGS sections this semester, and whose areas are on, um, who, whose areas center Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, um, gender and gender theory. Um, so um, yes, we have, I could go, I could go on and on and list so many more. <laughs> So many more um, courses um, for you, um, but yeah, those are those are those are some that that come to mind. Um, and again, um, just you know, we have women in music, um, and uh, we have um, so many others across uh, genes and gender, cross list with biology, uh, gender and politics <laughs> is a really great great course. Cross list with political science. Um, lots of other other courses um, as well. But definitely each semester students can choose from um, WGS electives that are across multiple disciplines. So again, whether the social natural sciences um, or the humanities. Oh, one more great course I'm so excited about that we're, we're offering for the first time this fall, um, race, class, gender, equity issues in education with the phenomenal Dr. Roland, who's one of our women's and gender studies core faculty who is joint in WGS and secondary education. Um, and Dr. Smith um, Purveyance is also developing a, a, a course for us in the fall, which we're really excited about on black girlhoods, black girl magic. And then finally, um, Dr. Trina Vitha Yassel is developing um, a new cross-listed WGS course with global studies that's going to look at gender, feminisms, gender inequality, and feminist movements in India that we're very excited about as well. Well, I think this is a great moment to segue to Kara and talk to her a little bit about her experience as a women's and gender studies student. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks. Thank you. It was my pleasure. I really appreciate the conversation. Kara, can you tell us what drew you to women and gender studies in the first place? Yes. So before I came to Providence College, I had the opportunity to go to an all-girls high school in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, the Lincoln School for Girls. And through that experience, um, it really made me very interested in women's and gender studies and very interested in women's issues and women's oppression um, within the United States. So then when I went to Providence College, what originally really got me interested in the program was on my student revisit day. So on one of my revisit days, I ended up being able to talk to Dr. Abigail Brooks, who is the director of the Women's and Gender Studies program. Um, and we just talked about the program and talked about what is what is talked about, you know, like different types of feminisms, intersectionality. So when you don't look at just gender, but like race, class, gender, sexualities, everything combined. So that really drew me into the program. Um, and then when I started, um, I actually declared without taking an intro class at the time. Um, and I met with Abigail to follow up on our conversation from the revisit day. And it was really just a great conversation. And, and I just got really inspired to want to learn more about women's issues within this country and learn more about how it intersects with different identities that people have within this country. Um, so that's kind of really what drew me to the program. Um, and then when I did intro to women's and gender studies, that interest just kept growing because I was introduced to so many new people and different types of feminisms, like black feminisms, um, intersectionality, and looking at things through a more complex lens and just simply focusing on gender or simply focusing on race and things like that and how everything kind of combined. Um, what can you tell us about some of the classes you've taken through women's and gender studies and that you found engaging and particularly interesting? Yeah, so there's been so many incredible classes that I've taken. Um, one that really stands out to me is gender, health and tech that I took with Dr. Brooks. Um, and that really focuses on, you know, I think the thing that really stood out to me in that class was the idea of how like the healthcare disparities that are seen within this nation and how the care that 
um, black people face within this, within this nation, like there's a lot of stereotypes surrounding their care. So, you know, women are not believed to experience as much pain as white women. So they won't get prescribed the same medication or get the same treatment. And a lot of other, you know, stereotypes that go into um, the medical system and how black people are perceived. So that really has a lot of negative health effects. Um, you know, like there was one reading I did that focused on how black women would just tend to get diagnosed with like breast cancer at a later stage than white women um, because, you know, doctors would turn them away and the reading, you know, it was like, oh, well, it's just a lump. It's not cancer. Like it's nothing to be concerned about. And it's like they wouldn't really give that woman the time of day because of the color of her skin. Whereas with white women, they would get the right treatment and they will get the time and care um, that they needed from doctors. So that was something that really stood out to me was that class. Um, I'm also taking a new class. It's the first time it's being taught at Providence College by Dr. Ashley Smith Purveyance called Black Feminisms. And there's so much that I'm learning about um, Black feminisms. And it's, you know, you really learn how the mainstream women's movement really did leave Black women behind. So Black women have created like this black feminist movement to really highlight their lived experiences and their oppressions that they face. So you really, it's just been great to get to be introduced to so many amazing scholars within black feminisms and really see how, well, you know, the mainstream white women's movement has created a lot of change. It wasn't inclusive. So that's really come to the forefront. Um, and that's something that's been very eye opening for me to learn. Um, and another one I'm taking is race, class, and gender, which is also a new class that's being taught this semester by Dr. Christopher Chambers. Um, and that's another incredible class. And there we're really talking about intersectionality and exploring the intersections of different identities that people have and how it's important to kind of analyze things, not just looking through one lens, but looking at the complexities of how people identify. So I would say those are like the three of the classes I would like to highlight. I feel like they've just been very eye-opening and I've really had a great experience. All of the professors are incredible. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's been a great learning experience. There's so many things that I realized that I didn't learn. And these classes are really introducing to introducing me to new topics. And, you know, it's like, I'm still like, it's making me, I guess, more confused in a way, because they're introducing me to all these new things and perspectives, which I think is a good thing. I don't know if confused is the right word or more curious. Like, it sounds like you want to know more. It's, it's like, piquing your interest. You want to know more about so many different aspects that you had no idea existed. Yes, for sure. For sure. It's definitely opened my eyes and just made me want to just keep learning and just keep looking at the world with a new lens, I guess, than what I previously looked at it, which is more simplistic, but really looking at the complexities and the different layers um, that people's identities have. So how do you think that you're you'll be able to use this, um, these skills and like this new perspective that you have, um, in the future, which is my sneaky way of asking you, you're a senior, what do you think you'll be doing after graduation? Yeah. So I am currently still in the process of figuring that out at this point. I think there's a lot of things that, um, I want to explore, like maybe, you know, I'm also a history, uh, major as well. So pursuing something history or women's and gender studies. Um, but what's great is that with my two majors, you can really combine the two disciplines. Like a lot of my history research papers that I've written have centered around women. So I did a paper on women in Renaissance Venice on like adultery and fornication. I did a paper on women during the French Revolution. So it's really great to be able to combine those two disciplines. Um, and when it comes to skills, I think I've gotten so many skills, you know, academically and just on my worldview um, through my women's and gender studies major. The classes are very reading heavy and writing heavy. So it's a great opportunity to work on those reading skills and writing skills, as well as, you know, your, your oral communication. A lot of the classes are discussion based, which I really like because you can learn from your professors, you can learn from your peers. And it kind of gets rid of like that professor, like kind of talking at you. It's like a space where we all learn from each other. So I really um, admire that. And I think outside of academia, just, you know, politics, it's been it's been a very interesting political seen these days. So um, I think I have a new lens kind of looking at the politics and looking at um, how society is. And it's kind of helping me understand that a little bit more. That's actually a pretty great segue because I wanted to ask you a little bit about your college experience and all the history that's happened um, 
during your last, the last four or five years, I mean, you were a college senior. Um, I'm sorry, you were a high school senior when um, former President Trump was inaugurated and, you know, thousands of women went to Washington, D.C. Um, for the Women's March. And then just in January, you are now a college senior and we're, we're, you were able to witness um, the inauguration of our first woman as vice president. So I'm just curious how you reflect on the things that have happened in the last uh, five years. Yeah, it's been a crazy five years um, to put it that way. But I think, yeah, so during the 2016 election, I was at uh, Lincoln School, which is the all girls school that I mentioned earlier. And it was definitely a empowering experience to be there. I feel like we all kind of like mourn together when she didn't win, when when Hillary Clinton didn't win the election. Um, and it was a very safe environment to really express those emotions because the school or my class at least was more liberal. Um, but yeah, coming to PC with with the election of our former president, um, yeah, it's just it's crazy to see that we went from, you know, somebody like our former president who has more, I would say, white supremacist values to, you know, President Joe Biden, who um, who chose, you know, Vice President Kamala Harris. It was such an empowering moment. And, you know, she's the first black woman, the first woman of um, Indian descent to be uh, the vice president. And it was just such a powerful moment. It makes me emotional to talk about it. Um, that's kind of how I felt just to see like a woman, you know, be like, that high in, 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 you know, our, our politics and, and really just see her as an inspiration as a figure and sending that message that like all women can, can do this. All women can set out to be, you know, vice president or eventually president one day. We were so close in 2016. Um, so yeah, it's just absolutely incredible. Um, but I think it, I, I also try to keep in mind that, you know, we are living in a society where there's so much pushback and there's so much criticism that Vice President Harris faces because of racism, because of patriarchy. Um, so while we're making so much progress, I think for me, it's so important to keep in mind that, like, just because she's the vice president doesn't mean like our work is done. Women have accomplished equality like that's not, you know, black people have accomplished equality. That's not um that's not the right way to look at this. It's an incredible moment, um, but there's still a long way to go for women and for people of color and for minorities to be seen as equal within this country. Um, and I also want to mention too, it's not just, you know, Vice President Harris, who's such an inspiration. There's amazing, incredible women in Congress, um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, those women are such an inspiration as well and what they're doing. And they're really speaking out against the oppressions that people face within this nation. So it's very inspiring to see women really become leaders and really have, you know, for me, have other women to look up to in the political field. Um, I imagine that in the last four years in your classes, both in history and in women's and gender studies, you've had a lot of current events to unpack, though. Um, are there some particular conversations or moments where you felt like your classes helped you understand what was happening in the in the larger world? Yeah. So some of the major events um, when Brett Kavanaugh was, you know, the hearings for him going on to the Supreme Court, that was a major conversation and talking point within our classes um, and about the Me Too movement as well and how women are just they're just not, you know, believed like their stories are not really believed. And we kind of talk about, you know, the, the white privilege, the male white privilege that men have within this nation. Um and how like it's like this idea that they're kind of like above the law, like Brett Kavanaugh, you know, he's on the Supreme Court. Nothing really happened. Um, he didn't really face any punishment for his actions. So like we definitely talk about that patriarchal lens um, and the insurrection on January 6th has been a huge, huge talking point in a lot of my classes where we just kind of try to unpack um, the white supremacy behind that and really highlight the fact that, you know, in a way like. We're, we're still feeling the repercussions of, of the foundations of what this nation was built on, which was the enslavement of African peoples and that oppression. And we're still feeling, you know, these, this need for white people, within, for some white people, not all, for some within this nation to still, you know, 
have, you know, do whatever they can to maintain that power. And we saw that with the former presidents, you know, saying like the election was fake, the election was false, the results were false. Um, and then having the people, you know, incite an insurrection on the Capitol building of the United States of America. Um, so that's definitely come up as well. And that, you know, white supremacy and racism is still very alive and well within this nation. So we definitely, um, that has definitely come up multiple times. Kara, I also know that you're a part of some organizations on campus that were organizing events around um, Women's History Month and, you know, the, the college is basically wrapped up Women's Week. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the events that were held last week um, and the organizations that uh, coordinated them? Yeah, so um, Providence College Democrats are the main organizers of Women's Week, but we had incredible co-sponsors like Women Will, Women Empowered, um, Shepherd as well on campus. And yeah, it was very, very, um, we did our first event was on Monday and it was a student panel about women's, you know, lived experiences on campus. And it was really a time for women to share their stories, to speak their truth, um, but also to talk about how the college can improve, what the college can improve um, and do differently going forward. And, you know, one thing that really stood out to me was the curriculum um, and development of Western civilization and how that um, is more of a white man's narrative for the most part and how voices of women, voices of black people, voices of Native Americans, like all of that is kind of left out of that narrative. Um, so that was a huge talking point to try to have more representation within the classroom. Um, and another, yeah. And then the second event was a faculty panel that we put on. Um, and that was so incredible where we just talked about different types of feminisms and intersectionality and inclusivity and representation as well. So it was a great way to celebrate, um, what women are doing and what the students are doing and organizations are doing. But I think it was also a great way to critique how women, you know, are treated on this campus as well and to bring light to those issues. And I think there were a few other events as well, like um, with campus ministry, for example. Yes, campus ministry um, hosted an event uh, on pornography, and that was very interesting as well. And it was great to see, you know, camp men get involved from a women's point of view as well. And, and this isn't, you know, this is an issue, you know, women's, issues are issues for so many different people. Um, so it was great to see a lot of clubs and organizations come together um, to put on events for Women's Week. Well, Kara, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having me. Subscribe to the Providence College podcast in all the usual places, including iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, as well as your smart speaker. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Thanks for listening and go Friars.